Hi, and welcome to Power Views. I'm Dan McDade, your host and president of Point Clear. This show is dedicated to finding solutions to some of today's toughest marketing and sales challenges. My guest today is jo James Obermeyer. Um, and I'll just tell you a little bit about James. James is the author of four books, and he's a speaker on subjects of, around sales lead management, sales enablement, and marketing ROI. He's the founder of an organization that has 4,600 worldwide members called the Sales Lead Management Association. They also have a LinkedIn group with over 2,600 members. And the Sales Lead Management Association, or the SLMA, is the sponsor of the yearly Sales Lead Management Week and the annual contest for the 50 most influential people in sales lead management, which I'm proud to say I've been one now for the last three years. Um, sales Lead Management also names the top 20 women to watch in sales lead management. They also have a weekly um, uh, radio show on SLMA Radio. Uh, James is also the principal of Sales Leakage, Inc., an Orange County, California marketing and sales interim management consulting firm. His career has really been divided equally between sales and marketing positions. He's been the vice president of sales and marketing for a B2B direct marketing agency. He served as the VP of worldwide sales at an enterprise software company and, a, and an internet services company and senior VP for two industry-leading inquiry management firms and also vice president of, for a medical device manufacturer, something near and dear to my heart. Um, in addition, he's written more than 95 articles on sales and marketing management, and he is a frequent speaker for corporations and also at national regional conferences. Hey, Jim, welcome to Power Views. Where are you there? <laughs> Good morning, Dan. How are you? You just never know what to expect when you have Jim on the line here. You know, these long bios, you know, it's easy to fall asleep. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell everybody you wrote it, okay, so that's not my fault. <laughs> So um, what's happening? I mean, what's, what are you seeing in 2012 that uh, either you didn't expect to see or what, what isn't happening that you expected to see? What, how do you, we're almost at the halfway mark now, so how do you kind of uh, recap 2012 so far? Same struggles, new year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, more talk about marketing and sales alignment, uh, really becoming a subject uh, matter for a lot of the conferences. Um, it's uh, it's interesting. I'm more involved with DemandCon this year, and SLMA is going to be a, a, a media sponsor, the lead media sponsor for them. So we're really going to work on that. And I guess a lot of the subjects really have to do with this whole marketing and sales alignment. Yet, yet as much as we talk about it, we just don't see people doing it. I mean, everybody wants to hear about it, and then they go, <laughs> go back and don't do anything about it. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then there's a, a lot more talk from the... Um, marketing automation people about how uh, uh, Phil Fernandez said the other day that uh, cold calling is going away and uh, HubSpot said, uh, oh, traditional ways of generating leads are dead and they may be partially right. There's a pretty bright guys over there. Yeah. And I was out there for their analyst briefing a week ago in Boston. Uh, I didn't go to the Red Sox game that night. Fenway Park, it was raining, and the diehard guys went out anyway. I, uh. I, uh, being a Californian, I took the easy way and went for dinner. But uh. Uh, g Great. So uh, I think we're going to see that much of the same. But I am seeing, because of my interim management, and, and we've interviewed um, nearly 120 people on SLMA radio. And uh, between the interim sales management, the people I talk to, everybody seems to be lifting off this year. So the big change I see is, is the spending of money in marketing. Telemarketing, uh, outbound telemarketing firms, lead qualification firms seem to be getting more business. They're filling the seats, and people are starting to spend money on marketing and lead generation. Uh, marketing automation is lifting off as these companies get more and more aggressive uh, HubSpot doesn't make any bones about the fact they produce, are you ready for this, 45,000 inquiries a month. They've got 80 to 85 salespeople uh, on the phones a month for their services. They're, they're a machine that's just chunking away, chopping away at the marketplace. Uh, and their segmentation system allows them to take that 45,000 inquiries and, and, and knock it back. So it's just interesting how the the money seems to be there for, for people that can measure the return on investment. 
Yeah, I actually heard Jean Hopkins speak a couple of times over the last month, once up in New York City and once here in Atlanta. And by the way, she's an excellent speaker. She really knows her stuff. And she mentioned some of those same numbers. I think um, one of the things she talked about, she asked, uh, uh, they happened to have a sales rep from HubSpot in the audience, and she said, how did you feel about those leads before we started doing the filtering process? And he said, basically what most sales reps say is that the leads sucked. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so... And, and then, you know, what do you think about the leads now? And, and he, he admitted that the lead quality had gotten better. One of the things that I think is fascinating, and it kind of leads into the next question, is is that um, if you said, you know, who, who would you guess would be the category of companies that are among the most, out, most aggressive outbound cold callers, you know, they're basically they're the marketing automation <laughs> companies. So on one hand, of the, you know, on one side of the coin, they talk about how, you know, cold calling is dead. And on the other side of the coin, you know, if anybody even um, uh, kind of sees their website in passing, you know, they're going to get a cold call, you know, from one of the marketing automation firms. And so, and I know you're passionate about this topic too. You know, there's a lot of talk about inbound marketing. Um, at the same time, there's an awful lot of aggressive outbound marketing going on. Where do you think it ends up? It is, is it one or the other, or is it a balance of both? And you know, what do you think is going to happen here? Well, we can't get away from the basic integrated marketing. Uh, everybody wants to take this to the cheapest side on the Internet. Everybody wants the prospect to identify themselves. Uh, the, the stats that keep showing up are 70% of the decision and education is made before a person ever wants to talk to a salesperson. But where do they get that information? They get it for, uh, as they begin to make their decisions. They're getting that information very often from the mailers, from the emails, uh, from the trade shows. They're still getting it from a variety of sums, uh, a variety of, of avenues. And the, and the people that try to only use one vehicle, maybe HubSpot's different. Uh, the, the, a lot of the marketing automation companies don't believe in trade shows. They don't go to them. You don't mm -hmm. see them at very many. They only go usually if they're speaking or there's some other thing that's driving their whole passion there. But they don't really go for leads. They go for branding where other people in other industries, as you know, the medical device industry, they're still going out to trade shows and they're going for cold, hard, qualified leads. Companies like New Leads out there doing uh, uh, using iPads for lead acquisition at trade shows are having banner years because uh, the people really want qualified leads out of trade shows. So uh, uh, the marketing automation companies, the Eloquas, the Marketos, the Aprimos, et cetera, et cetera, they're all drinking their own Kool-Aid and they're doing a great job. Uh, and they've abandoned, I think, some of the traditional methods of generating leads, but. The rest of the great unwashed B2B group out there still has to rely on some mail uh, that gets through to people. I've got a, a client in the, in the uh, uh, video field, a national client in the video field, and we're using a variety of mail, email, and telemarketing, the one, two, three punch, mm -hmm. uh, hitting very targeted, very targeted uh, prospects. Uh, on the upper end of their marketplace. And uh, it's very interesting how that's working. And it hasn't gone away. This is the email goes out with an offer. The mail goes out five days later. The phone call follows it up. And uh, they're creating appointments and turning these things into sales. So uh, the basics haven't died. They've just uh, shifted. Well, there's a couple of things that I've found interesting over the last couple of weeks. I just got back from the Serious Decisions Conference, and it was, by the uh, way, yeah. an excellent conference, about 1,100 people there, and that they just seem to be doing better and better every year. And, and the theme of the conference actually was alignment, and they talked about how important alignment was. But, you know, um, the Corporate Executive Board apparently recently did some research, and they found that, um, that sales reps that um, mostly followed up on inbound leads were really among the average sales reps, and those sales reps that were m much more proactive, you know, actually going after enterprise accounts or more strategic accounts with with outbound activity, actually, were, you know, those were the exceptional reps. Those are the reps that they did better. And I know we've had a couple of clients over the last year. In one case, they basically eliminated our the work that we do and went with a marketing automation uh, type solution. And in the end. What happened is they saw their deal size driven down to about a third of what it was when, when we were working with them. So obviously at this point now they're back with us. And then there's another, actually a very large firm. I can't say the name just because not only are they a client, but they're also a um, pretty well-known company. But they generated 9,000 leads in 2011. 
you know, the sales reps basically said they got zero leads, and the marketing department said, well, how can that be? We sent you 9,000 leads. We actually sampled the leads, and they're the most significant source of leads, which is from a content aggregator. There's about 6,000 of them. We estimated the lead rate based on some testing we did was about 1%. So, you know, it's obvious that sales reps aren't going to follow up on 100 leads just to get one potential opportunity. Actually, that's one of the three things I have in, a, in an article that I just published. It's just new on our website called uh, Point C from Chaos to Kick-Ass, three things that you can do <laughs> right now to align marketing and sales. So, um, you know, it is interesting when you're out there in the marketplace that um, – People are talking about 70% of the buying process is done before a sales rep need, needs to get involved. I think, frankly, that's more sort of commoditized type selling, and you're also going to drive down the average deal size. You know, you're probably going to be column fodder in a lot of evaluations if you wait that light in the sales cycle. What do you think? Yeah, you're, you're right. I've seen a resurgence in uh, value-added selling, believe it or not, okay. uh, because companies are being hammered on price from these people who uh, they call up the sales rep, uh, they contact the company, and the sales rep calls them, and they said, well, we've done all your research, maybe, maybe not, and uh, we want to go ahead and, and uh, get a price, and uh, uh, they immediately go to price. They're shoppers, and uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't really tell you the fact that they've been talking to one or two salespeople from their most valued suppliers for five months, and the only reason they're talking to you at this point is to get the fourth bid right, or the exactly. third bid. Right. And then this person's trying to create value, and it's way too late in the chain to create value. So um, several clients of late are just hammering this uh, value-added selling, and the second edition was, was published this last year. Uh, and uh, we did a review on the SLMA book site, uh, the book review portion, but uh, the value-added selling is probably the most action-packed book on selling strategies I've ever read. And to clean out my office just for you today, I had a stack <laughs> over here in that corner next to my antique phone that was this high in books that we're reviewing one at a time getting through. I get books all the time getting sent in. And I still find value-added selling to be one of the most action-packed, uh, actionable books. And, the, and when I go to clients, we just don't – when we talk about these books and strategies, uh, if we embark on a book and a strategy at a company and decide we're going to do this uh, – I mean, this is my other life other than SLMA – uh, the part that I make a living at. Yeah, right. You know that part. Yeah. Uh, in, in any case, when we do that uh, – I go ahead and do usually do a presentation on that book, uh, Value Added Selling, and then we go over three chapters a week until we finish it, and it takes about 12 weeks. And everybody in the company does it, from the salespeople to the customer service people to the company president to everybody, reads the book, reads the chapters, comments on it every single week, so it becomes part of the DNA in a company. And it's amazing how the company stops discounting stops discounting their value, uh, separates the leads much much faster, ask better qualifying questions, and create value from the start, not trying to do it at the, at the end. So um, I don't think value-added selling has gone away. I think the marketing automation companies all would like us to believe that um, they're delivering uh, the most qualified leads. This is no surprise. I, I produced a book in 1996 generations ago almost, <laughs> and uh, the first book on sales leads. It's still out there, 12,000 copies. Used copies on the Internet are traded back and forth all the time because it has a lot of research in it. And what we found in the hundreds of Did You Buy research that we did was any contact after the initial inquiry, any contact at all, uh, by telephone, by the way, but mail helps. But any of those contacts helps the company and pushes up their closing ratio by as much as 50%. And some of this was research done with Euler Packard. So, uh, you know, the usual sales figures Gil Cargill talks about, 48% of the salespeople give up after the first phone call. Maybe maybe Gil took that from Sales and Marketing Management Magazine, I suspect. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, so the, the multiple contact program, which everybody knew worked because it takes six to eight contacts, touches to actually make a sale, marketing takes over some of those contacts, the marketing automation companies say, put our program in place and you sell 2 to 300% more. Well, of course. 
It, it just took them 18 longer years to figure it out than other people in the industry. Uh, emails, mail, and phone calls immediately into the prospect sets the table. You know what happens in B2C. You know, if somebody calls within 45 seconds of someone clicking the button for a, a car loan or a mortgage loan, they have something like an 80% better chance to make the sale than the person who calls five minutes after the person clicked it. And that's up on the research. Right, right. You know, um, uh, t talking about this, um, I have this expression that many people have heard, but that's, you know, nobody ever builds a statue to a committee, and that when you talk about alignment in a company, you know, the alignment really is owned by the most senior executive in the company. So let's say it was a smaller company, it might be the CEO, larger companies, it might be the senior VP of sales and marketing. One of the things that uh, I heard when I was at the Serious Decisions this week was as SAP's um, CMO basically decided that the, that the marketing organization was going to own um, the the um, the responsibility for aligning the company and not just sales and marketing, but HR and finance and every other area of the company. And uh, you know, it sounds like they've done a real good job of doing that. But you know, what you, what else are you seeing? What what else are companies doing that you've seen that have been successful in aligning uh, around um, a more efficient process with marketing and sales? Well, it's always a fight, and you, you know, in my uh, the blog entries on your that I do for you once a month, which are probably better quality than what I do on my own site. I keep giving you <laughs> Thank the you. good stuff, <laughs> Thank Dan. You, I appreciate it. Elizabeth really pounds on me for the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. you know. But I anyway, I always talk about leadership, and somebody has to stand up. Company presidents are worried about one level. CFOs are working about uh, worried about another level. And the marketing managers and the sales managers who step forward and take the leadership, sales managers are usually too closely focused on what's happening and who they've got to replace and what they've got to do. The marketing manager takes a bigger, longer view. I, I tell a story that years ago when I worked for Beckman, I was walking down the hallway with somebody one day, and uh, uh, I was on the strategic planning staff, and I was also a marketing communications manager for the 2,000-person sales division. I was walking down the hallway, and with George Gramlich, and somebody said something when they went past, and I said, George, what'd they say? And he said, no, nothing. I said, no, well, then, I was curious, you know. <laughs> so I said, George, what'd they say? And he said, well, it was just your nickname. And I said, George, I've been here six years. I don't have a nickname. He said, oh, yes, you do. I said, so what's my nickname? He said, it's, they call you the Mosquito. <laughs> I said, the Mosquito? Why do they call the Mosquito? He said, because no matter how much we wave you away, you just keep coming back. <laughs> and... Uh, and I was a communications manager. Now, I worked with all the other communication managers throughout the company to try to get those people to actually create inquiries and leads based on what? Quota, right? Your favorite subject. Start, start backwards, right? So you start with quota, and you figure out how many inquiries do we have to produce. Now, the best companies that are lead machines still usually only produce enough to get 50 or 60 percent of the company sales in. Now, most companies would say, oh, that's wonderful. But the reality is that's all they can do because the salespeople get the rest of the sales out of their existing pipeline, out of preferences, out of cold calling, out of current customers. And uh, so you have to have a communications manager and a marketing manager who's enlightened. He says, my job, the job, the reason I exist, the reason they pay me every week, the reason I exist on earth in this particular job is to support that sales force and give them enough inquiries to make quota because the marketing manager is in charge of wealth building for the company. Absolutely. The marketing manager builds the wealth. The marketing manager is in charge of wealth building. He or she is the one that creates the buzz in the marketplace. If the marketing manager, a la Atlas Shrugged, suddenly decided to pull back all of his or her talents and disappear and stop within three months, sales in the company would plunge 20 to 30 percent for just about any company if the marketing manager withheld their talents. So that tells us who's the real wealth builder, pound for pound. And some of the women don't like that. But pound for pound, <laughs> the marketing management staff delivers more wealth for the company than their sales forces do because they present the, the top of the funnel. What do you think about that? What are you seeing that's happening out there? I mean, you're, you're working with a lot of pretty aggressive companies. 
is your business increased? Has things really started to lift off? Are companies getting more aggressive in creating qualified leads? Well, 2012 has been good for us so far. We're way up over last year. I don't know if that's because last year was bad or if 2012 is, even, is just that much better. But one, a couple of big trends that we're seeing right now is, number one, um, you know, sales reps are driven by three things, or sales in general is driven by three things. That's control, credit, and compensation. And right now what you're seeing is they're wanting to take control over this process. They want to own not necessarily the lead generation piece, but the lead qualification piece. So what, what we're seeing right now is a lot of folks that are um, moving inside sales or sales support over to the sales side of the house instead of the marketing side of the house. Don't know if I really agree with that, and I know some of the folks at Serious Decisions feels like that might be a, a mistake, you know, because uh, their philosophy, and my philosophy, are much, very much the same. That you've got marketing on one side of the equation, sales on the other. Neither one of those organizations are particularly great at doing that um, kind of lead management, um, nurturing, mm -hmm. uh, reheating, all of those types of things. So, you know, marketing has one mandate. Right now, unfortunately, that mandate is quantity of leads as opposed to quality of leads. Sales obviously has the mandate of having to drive revenue and you know that's why most leads that go over the fence really are not ever effectively followed up by sales. So um, the things that I'm seeing where companies are actually uh, seeing improvement and I've got two or three clients now that I'm working with on a consultative basis of taking a look at you know where are the leads coming from what percentage of those leads are becoming marketing qualified leads? What percentage become sales accepted? Eventually, obviously, sales qualified and then closed leads and tying everything back to the beginning for a couple of reasons. One, so that they understand when they do hit the point of diminishing returns. For example, on pay-per-click, companies will hit a point of diminishing returns sometimes a lot sooner than they wish. And then on outbound prospecting, you know, how can you drill for the less expensive barrels of oil as opposed to basically drilling for more expensive barrels of oil and not knowing it? So in other words, how can, how can you become more efficient in that whole process? What are, what are a couple of things at this point that you would recommend? You know, we're almost halfway through the year. Uh, we've got the, the eyes and the ears of uh, VPs of sales and marketing across the country. What do, what do you suggest that they look at for the rest of this year? If it's our fiscal year, uh, it's time they looked at their marketing plan and see what they accomplished and what they tossed out. It's time to look at the quotas and the size of the pipelines. Uh, for most of them, with a closing, uh, uh, with a sales cycle of, of three to six months, they barely have enough time to get on it now. Right. Uh, if they want to have a good close to the year, they have to use tactics that are going to bring in the most qualified leads. And... Uh, uh, I would suggest that they have to look at that. So it isn't just doing more webinars. Webinars are great for education. I love them, but most people agree webinars don't generally create the qualified leads. They create people who want to be educated. So you've got to lean towards the very large, uh, the things that can give you the most qualified leads in the shortest period of time. Now, what is that, really? Direct mail is still not dead. I don't care what the people in, um, in, in some of the, the uh, online uh, venues talk about. It's not dead. It's being used, and most of the direct marketing companies I know are still doing large flights of direct mail because now it's a differentiator. There's mm -hmm. less mail coming in. Yeah, right. Uh, email is still good, but let's face it. We all knew 15 years ago when email came on strong that sooner or later they'd be just like everybody else. The opening rate is still pretty low, and it's not going up anytime soon, no matter how good our subject lines are, no matter if we nail down the size of the subject line and really test it. Um, I have people telling me they spend as much time on the subject line as they do on the body copy, yeah. and it's almost like as much time on the title of your blog entry as you spend on the blog itself. Yeah. I, have so some, I, know I, some people that, I know some people that think that the title is all that matters. So. Yeah, probably. <laughs> For search engine but optimization. You, yeah, you've got to be able to, to pull things in. I look at it and say, look, uh, first thing I do is take a look at all the inquiry. If, if the company's behind at this time of the year and they're not making quota and they're behind and the marketing department has got control of this because the sales management has already whipped these people into a frenzy 
And they are, they're starting at this time of the year, if they're behind, to have sales meetings instead of sales meetings, right, right. Uh, which is uh, happening on a regular basis. I had a sales manager tell me the other day, he actually said, he said, Mondays is the most miserable day of the week for my salespeople. I hold them accountable. I nail their butts. I talk about their numbers, and they go out of there with their legs between their, their, their tails between their legs because they know they've got to do 80 calls a week. That's it, or we're going to get rid of them. I said, how's that working for you? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, we have had a few new people start, and they leave right away. We can't figure that out, Yeah. believe it or, <laughs> believe it or not, because he beats them up every Monday. I had to talk with him about, you know, he manages a Little League team. I said, so do you beat these people to death, these little guys to death when you go out there? Well, no, I don't. I've got a motivator. I said, well. So anyway, I'd look at, look at the quotas. I'd look at what's in the pipeline. I'd look at the difference of what's going to have, have to happen between those two. Uh, I would pull in a telemarketing firm to call inquiries from the last 12 months because research I've done for years, you know the numbers I give, 15 20%, 15% calls in three months, 26% in six months, 45% within a year. But the back-end numbers also show at six months, inquiries are six months old, just inquiries, not leads, six months old. 56% of the people are still in the marketplace. A year old, 36% of the people are still in the marketplace. So if you need to create sales, I'd go back and talk to those people. Some of them will say, well, you haven't called me yet before. Why are you calling now? I said, because it's never too late to do what we should have done right, to begin right. with. Right. We love you now, even if we were a little slow in loving you before. No, not really. But. So you know, I do a lot of telemarketing. I, I take a look at those trade shows that you canceled and show up because people who show up at trade shows uh, and go to that booth, they're going for a reason. Trade shows still take fewer closes, uh, touches to close the sale. So I would use that. I'd use large flights of both direct mail and email. And companies, you know, they say, well, it costs money. And so, well, of course it costs money to do that. I'd also get my sales, if you've got outside salespeople, I'd say you never, ever do uh, create a proposal that you don't deliver. Don't be lazy and send it by email. As soon as you deliver a proposal, you're going to sell more than the people who are lazy that sit behind. Uh, I talked to a client a couple of weeks ago, and he says, well, geez, we've got to fly people all over the country for these proposals. And I said, well, your average proposal is $50,000. Yeah. And it costs you three to $400 to fly them in. Yeah. I said, so if they close three of those a month, would you be unhappy? Well, no, I'd be ecstatic. And it only cost you 900 to $1,500? He said, well, I guess when you put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> Too many of these companies have CFOs in charge. The president's in charge of the first six months of the year. The CFO's in charge of the last six months because they're so worried about their profit level. But I'd say that you've got to get on this, uh, this, uh, this war path of creating uh, inquiries, and you've got to filter them the way the HubSpots and uh, <clears throat> the way most of the marketing automation firms are able to do uh, by by uh, taking a look, grading the inquiries when they come in, uh, uh, budget, uh, authority, need, time frame. These things have not gone out of style. You still have to qualify them. Uh, most, say, most marketing departments can pre-qualify 60 to 65% of the inquiries on the way in just by asking questions. I have so many of the marketing managers say, well, if I ask questions, aren't I being intrusive? Isn't that impolite? He said, no, it's not impolite. The person wants information. Ask a few questions. Yeah, you have qualified inquiries. Sales reps are going to follow them up. Yeah. All those that aren't qualified, give them to a great telemarketing firm. I drop my pen. I take notes. Excuse me. Back. <laughs> I go ahead and give them to a great telemarketing firm, either inside the company or outside, and say, you call these 35 to 40 percent, because there's just as many buyers in that 35 or 40 percent that were in the 60 percent. Yeah, I agree with that. As a matter of fact, we have you know program after program that shows that. Hey, Jim, how can uh, the audience get a hold of you if they want to reach out and have a conversation with you? What's the best way to do that? They can always go to Jay Obermeyer at, at uh, SalesLeadManagementAssociation.com. Uh, that's SalesLeadMGMTASSN.com. Well, they can give me a call at 714-998-1737. Uh, come on up on the Sales Lead Management Association. Just leave, uh, in, uh, just leave your name there uh, on info. I'd be happy to talk to anybody that wants to uh, wants to come in. Membership is free. There's a lot of information. Uh, there's some good advertising, I think, from people like you. Yeah, so we're a sponsor. 
Yes, you're a sponsor. You've been a sponsor for three years now. We really appreciate it. So well, I, I definitely encourage folks to go look at Sales Lead Management Association. And, Jim, thanks so much for taking time to be with me today. I know that we're going into a holiday weekend, so I appreciate your time. For now, this is Dan McDade signing off from another edition of Power Views. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Dan.